In this video, I'm going to talk about writing for the web and some best practice when it comes to web writing and in fact content online more generally. I'm going to cover in particular um, brevity and the importance of keeping text short and to the point. Um, the role that the user has in online writing, which is much larger than the role that they have in video and audio content, for example, and how to add value to your writing. Some of the unique qualities that web writing has compared to, for example, writing for analog media like books and newspapers and magazines. And to guide um, these writing principles, we have what's called the basic principles of web writing. These are um, five principles that start with the letters B, A, S, I, and C. And I'm gonna go through each in turn in this presentation. <coughs> so first of all, brevity. Brevity is perhaps one of the most important uh, qualities of good web writing. And it applies at the level of each paragraph in your story, but also the story as a whole. One of the reasons for this is that people read more slowly online. Some uh, research about a couple of decades ago by Jakob Nielsen found that people read about 25% uh, about slower online. So it's harder for them to take in the text that we're writing for them. Now the resolution of screens has improved since that research was done and it may well be that people don't read as slowly as they did back then but still there's a lot of evidence that suggests that they take in less information for example so the same research found that they took in less than 28% of the words on the page and perhaps most interestingly in some more recent research it was found that short paragraphs received twice as much attention as longer paragraphs. Now that might, need, might, might sound counterintuitive because longer paragraphs are longer. You would expect people to be spending longer reading them, but actually, no, that's what happened here. People spend more time reading shorter paragraphs. So short paragraphs are, are really fundamental to good web writing practice. If you want to see a, a, a great exemplar of how to write for the web, look at any news story on the BBC website. Um, they very simply put one idea in every paragraph. As soon as a point has been made, four men have been arrested, full stop, then they move on to a new paragraph. Scotland Yard said this, full stop, new paragraph, and so on. And although this is an example from news, it's an example of good practice which applies to any web writing, whatever you're writing about or for, whether it's a, a, a behind the scenes guide to what's happening in a, a documentary or a TV show or a, a radio program, um, these principles still apply. One good habit to get into is if you look at your first draft of a particular story, look at any paragraphs that are particularly large and try and split up the paragraphs that are in there. So in this example, you can see this is actually a piece of work by a student. You can see that every time there's a full stop in this article or almost every time, um, there's an opportunity here to split this paragraph. And in fact, um, the resulting second draft of the article should really have four paragraphs instead of this one. So always look at your work, review it and think, can I split this paragraph up? Have I made a point and can I move on to the next paragraph? Um, so that's at the level of the individual paragraphs. Paragraphs should be short in an article, but the article as a whole also certainly should consider being as short as possible. Um, there's a lot of evidence that shorter articles can perform better, or at least people tend to uh, not read longer articles or beyond a particular length. Now, there's conflicting evidence on this, so very long stories can perform very well. So perhaps the, the key principle to bear in mind here is that your article shouldn't be any longer than it needs to be. This particular chart shows where people stopped reading on a website, on a number of articles on a website, and you can see there's a big peak at the start where people uh, read the first screen of content but never scrolled beyond that. 
And overall, they found that people, that most people read about 60% of articles, of the, of the full article. So the lesson from this is that those articles were longer than they needed to be, um, or at least weren't written well enough for people to be reading past about 60% of the length of the article. So try and keep articles either short or long. Something in between medium length doesn't tend to do well. And of course, there are always exceptions to these guidelines. These are just guidelines, but always aim for brevity. Just to contradict that, that previous research, um, it's also been found that 66% of engagement with stories happens below the fold. In other words, after the first screen of content. So people do read uh, and engage more with articles, but they do need to be good long articles and long stories if that's what you're dealing with. So always justify the length, make sure you've got enough material for the length that you're working towards. Another approach you can adopt is what's called chunking. Um, this, is, uh, this is not just in text, but in audio and video as well. This is the process of um, splitting a longer piece of content into smaller parts. So for example, um, CNN uh, traditionally would do a, a, a political interview program where they ask a number of different interviews and, and that lasts for quite some time. But what they did a few years ago was split uh, what would have been an interview into separate questions and the answers to those as separate videos, and they called this the 15-second debates. So instead of one long program with lots of questions and answers, they would have one video for one question and answer, a separate video for another, and so on. Likewise, if you've got um, an article which goes on for 8,000 words, you might consider splitting that into 1,000 word parts. Um, and Vice, for example, in its video documentaries, will take a 30 minute documentary and split it into 10 minute sections on YouTube. Now what's important to emphasize here is that this isn't a choice to do one approach or the other. Quite often both approaches are done. Vice publishes the full 30 minute documentary on YouTube and it publishes three 10 minute chunks of the same documentary. What that means is that audiences can choose to consume that documentary in either way, either as a 30 minute whole or as free chunks. And equally, it provides four different opportunities for audiences to encounter that content. So instead of the one video, we now have four videos and people might come across one of those as their entry point into the story. Each chunk, of course, might have a different angle part one of a story might be different to part two, and so on. So always consider chunking as a strategy both to introduce brevity into longer content and also to increase the opportunities for people to encounter it. Now to move on to adaptability. And adaptability in web writing is quite simple really, there's two parts to it. The first is that you as a factual storyteller need to be adaptable. Um, what that means is that you need to be adaptable to uh, tell that story in different ways. Yes, you might write it, but equally you might tell it through video, you might tell it through audio, through interactivity, through short social um, updates, and so on. So always be open to different ways of telling a story and think about which way is going to be most effective and particularly which way is going to reach the audience that you're trying to reach. You might want to consider um, telling a story across more than one medium, for example. The other dimension of adaptability is the content itself, and um, considering whether you can make the content adaptable, in other words, can you make it usable by other people? One very simple way of doing this is putting a Creative Commons license on your content. The Creative Commons license allows other people to use your material, uh, to remix it, to edit it um, with attribution, so they have to say that you were the original author. And you can also set certain limits on that, so you might say that they can use it but they can't um, change it um, 
so for example a photo can't be manipulated it can only be used as it was originally made on YouTube now and a number of other platforms you can choose to um, apply the Creative Commons license to your content when you upload it and it's worth considering this because it means that um, first of all again it's more likely that people find your content if they're looking for content to remix but also it um, puts you in touch with other people who can build on what you've done and if that's your objective if you're looking for interaction engagement then Creative Commons can be quite an effective way of doing that. Moving on to scannability. Scannability is um, a dimension of writing for the web which touches into touches on the way that people consume online content and that is that they scan it. They scan across the screen and they scan for different things. They scan for indications around whether this content is relevant to them, whether it's authoritative and so on. And um, a couple of the ways that, that they do this is they look for subheadings, um, they look for links, and they look for bullet lists. All of those three examples of scannability are good ways of providing touch points in your content that can help users to understand what it's about. So subheadings, for example, I would recommend writing a subheading every few paragraphs in your story just to um, kind of summarise or introduce the section that follows. Um, not only does that help users understand the different parts of your story, but it also helps search engines as well. Bullet points are a good way of introducing lists and even related links as in this example here. And links themselves are massively important as a form of scannability. They're something that, people, that people's eyes catch on as they scan through an article and they send a signal that your story is not just your opinion, for example, but this is a story that's based on research um, and that has some value because links themselves are valuable, they're, they're a piece of information um, and which we'll come on to later. Some other elements of it, scannability to consider include the headline itself, the title of your story. Um, sometimes stories don't have those and, and you must absolutely have some sort of heading on your story. Um, as well as bullet lists, you can have numbered lists and quotes um, are a really important opportunity for um, adding scannability to your story. If you have any quotes in your story, it's worth making them into block quotes. In other words, select the quote and if you apply the block quote um, feature, which I'll, I'll show you how to do that in a minute, um, then that will normally indent the quote, um, maybe make it italic or add some extra formatting. And what that does is it, it um, shows the reader again, like links, that your article isn't just your opinion, but actually you've got people speaking in this story that you've, you've um, interviewed people or you've quoted people. So it's a good sign of the value um, that's, that's in your story. People are interested in quotes and, and who's in your story. As well as links, you can make certain words or phrases bold. This can be quite effective when you use it with any names of people or organizations or concepts, places, essentially the, the, the characters and the settings in your story. When they're first introduced in your story, if you make the name of that person or place bold, then it, again, it's easier for the reader to find the characters and settings in the story. The introduction to your story is also an element of scannability. Um, this is something that search engines will give more weight to, so they will look at the very first paragraph of your story and use that to try and understand what it's about. So it should definitely include um, the key elements of your story, but uh, for humans in particular, it should be clear and simple. It should be very clear what this story is about. And images. Images can be used to make a story scannable. They can be used to break up the story um, and almost act as as a sort of a subheading as well. So consider introducing an image every screen as you scroll down. So any particular screen always has an image in it. 
I said I would show you how to add block quotes um, and also links and bullet lists. With all of these, normally what you would do in your content management system, so in WordPress or Medium, is that you select the text that you want to make into a block quote or a bullet list or a link, and then you click on the button that corresponds to that feature. So here you can see the button for making a bullet list at the top and the button for making a quote underneath. On Medium, these buttons appear after you select the text. So you select the text first and then some buttons will pop up allowing you to format it. Let's move on to interactivity then. I mentioned links as a form of scannability. Linking is absolutely fundamental to interactivity as well and fundamental to writing for the web. Um, if you think about video being all about pictures and radio being all about sounds, writing for the web is all about links. There must be some sort of interactivity in a story online or it is just a page of writing that's been slapped on the web. It needs to be linked, it needs to be connected to the rest of the web. So whenever you write some content for the web, always be thinking about how you can link as part of that, where you might be able to add some value for the audience. And there are some, some obvious ways to do this. You might be linking to um, background information that relates to what you're talking about. So if you talk about a particular event, you can link to some more information about that event. Likewise, if you mention a concept, so it might be global warming or pollution, then um, you can link that to more information about what that concept means. How you link is important as well. There's, there are, there, there's a good way to link and there's a bad way to link. The, the, link uh, the way that you link sends a signal about what you are linking to. So here we can see two examples. They both are the same sentence, but the link, uh, links have been applied in different ways. In the first example, the links have been applied to the words Taylor Swift and the word folklore. Now, the signal that that sends to the reader is that the first link is a link to Taylor Swift herself. So it might be her official web page or her social media account. But when we see that word linked, when we see that noun linked, we expect that link to take us to that thing in some way. Likewise, the album link, folk folklore, we expect that to take us to that album. In contrast, if you link the phrase dropped her ape studio album, and here we're linking a verb dropped rather than a noun. In that second example, what we expect to be linked to is some sort of story about that event, uh, that, that verb, that action. And that's normally the better way to link. Um, really, there's, there's rarely a need to link to nouns. We don't need to, to take someone to Taylor Swift's homepage um, or possibly even to the page for an album because that's quite general and the user can find it themselves. But the second example is much more specific. Here we're linking to some background information to what we're talking about. So always be clear in what you link to. Try and link on verbs and specific stories and background and things like that rather than nouns. If you're linking to nouns, people and places, it's not really that useful and it's not very specific. Also, never link with URLs. Always try and link the words. Now, linking is not only uh, great in terms of providing value to the, to the reader, but it also tends to be uh, associated with, mo with more successful content. There's research that suggests that it helps people's uh, understanding of articles, that they see articles as being um, better, so it, their perception of quality, and um, they tend to spend longer with that content as well, so their behaviour, if you like, is improved by those links. And here are some more examples just to, to demonstrate that. Um, you can see an example here, the agency's full report is published on Monday. Actually, that's an example where linking to a noun is appropriate and we're linking to a very specific thing, a specific report. 
By contrast, the, the example in the upper left where it says the editor of the New York Times and the, the words New York Times are linked, you would expect that to take you to the New York Times, but actually it takes you to the section on that website with other articles about that. And the reason they've done that is for search engine optimization. It's actually not very useful for the audience. Another example there, in an interview to mark the International Herald Tribune's relaunch, um, so that's linking to that interview. And of course, you can use links to add related stories and more information, so that's another option to consider in your linking. This is how you create a link, select the text, and again, um, use the link button, it's normally a chain, to apply a link to that text, so to turn that text into a hyperlink. And as I said, always do that. Don't paste a URL into an article. Apart from anything else, it's not clear where that URL goes. And avoid phrases like click here or click to find out. Just highlight the text that is the thing that they are going to get when they click and then link it. So you don't need to say, um, click here to donate to this charity, you can use the phrase, um, people can donate to the charity on their website. And if you link the phrase, donate to the charity on the website, then people know that they can click on that link to do that. Related to linking is the practice of embedding. In fact, you could argue that embedding is the new linking. Um, embedding is a way of bringing content into a story rather than linking to it externally and people having to leave your story to, to get to that. So for example, videos and social media updates are classic examples of content that can be embedded. Yes, we could link to a video, we could link to a tweet, but actually it's um, probably going to be more interesting and more helpful to embed it instead. So um, in a lot of cases, all you need to do to embed material like this is to paste the URL of the video, if it's a YouTube video, or paste the URL of a Twitter update or Instagram update or Facebook update. And if you press enter after pasting it, as long as it's on its own line, it, certainly in Medium and WordPress, it will then automatically embed that content. And what that means is that people can uh, interact with that content directly within your story. So they can play the video, they can, um, they can share it. Likewise with tweets, they can not only um, interact with the tweet and click on any links, view any media in that tweet, but they can follow the user directly, they can retweet and so on. So always consider embedding content, particularly if it's social or video. Another form of interactivity is the call to action. This is um, in the way that you write your material and your headlines. So at the end of a story, you might invite people to tell you if they've experienced the thing that you just told them a story about. Um, equally, you might uh, invite people to share their opinion on social media using a particular hashtag. You can use calls to action in the titles and headlines of stories as well. These are some examples, some great examples from articles in magazines. Um, in uh, fashion magazines, we've got the story shop for punk inspired styles. So the, the call to action is to shop. In NME, we've got tour the birthplace of punk rock. Fortune, watch how, read about. These calls to read, watch, meet, um, join. These are really useful in bringing people into your stories, your, your online events, every, anything that you're doing. So think about if you can phrase the title of your story to be a call to action rather than just um, a, a title. And then finally, we've got community and conversation. Um, the final point to make about writing for the web is to remember that your content is not just a, a, a story to be passively consumed and experienced and then that's the end of it. One of the qualities of the internet is its connectivity, its community, the fact that you are part of a network of other things. Um, so 
always be thinking about where the user goes next and where you go next as well. So is there some sort of hashtag where they can follow the conversation? Is there some sort of tool that they can use to take action? Um, use those calls to action to invite them to comment or to contribute. And consider your own role as well and whether you can engage with the community directly to take the story to them. Should you be publishing it on a particular Facebook group, a Facebook page, um, a Reddit forum, something like that? Think about where you publish and how that connects with the community involved. So those are the um, basic principles. The key points to sum up with are to just think about those five principles, in particular brevity, um, scannability, and interactivity. Keeping paragraphs brief, making the medium serve the story. Consider the user as not just a passive recipient of your story. Think about how they can interact with your story. Um, think about how they can act afterwards. And think about how you add value to your story through your use of links, through any embedding and illustration as well. Now, um, to illustrate some of the uh, things to avoid in this respect, this is uh, one particularly bad example I wanted to show you. So this is, this is a video that was produced for a radio show called Eastside Live Lounge, and it was put on a website for people to um, watch um, and you know, the, the radio show may well have directed people to the website to watch this. There are some real problems with this. The first one is the title of the article itself. The title of an article should always tell us what we can expect specifically as readers or viewers or listeners. And in this case, the title is merely the title of the show overall. But this isn't the show, this is an interview from the show. So we need to make sure that the headline, the title, tells us that. This is particularly important because the title is likely to be what people see in search engine results if they're searching for something. So if I was searching for an interview with this particular band, which is what this video is, then um, I'm not likely to find it, first of all, because the, the, t the article doesn't tell Google that this is an interview with a band. So Google doesn't know what it is and Google is going to use that title to understand it. But also, even if it did come up in search results, I wouldn't know it was an interview with this band because the title alone doesn't say it. So we really need the name of the band and the word interview, possibly the word video in the headline. And in fact, we could go one better and use a call to action. We could say something like, watch our interview, our video interview with the name of the band. So we've got lots of good things going in there in terms of a call to action, um, what it is, who it's with. The same applies to the video. The video has been uploaded to YouTube with the same title. So if you were searching on YouTube, and YouTube is one of the biggest search engines in the world, there are more searches conducted on YouTube than on Bing or any other search engine apart from Google. So if I was searching on YouTube, I'm unlikely to find it based on the band name because it's not in the title. So always consider the title of videos on YouTube as well and make sure that you have a description with the video that tells us a bit more and again includes keywords and tells us a story alongside that video. For the same reason, uh, this article needs an introduction. The um, what has been done here is we've got a headline and a video, but no text, no introduction to the video. That is a problem in terms of search engines. So again, Google doesn't have any text to understand what's in this video. But also as a reader, what I'm getting is a title where nothing is happening, and then just this video. I've not got any text that tells me what to expect in this video or why I should play it. So. If you're putting a video online, always have some text that tells a story about the video. We interviewed this particular band, find out about what they think about X, Y, and Z. So just a, a very brief summary of what they talked about, who they were, and of course, that tells me why I should watch this. In terms of further reading around this subject, around web writing, um, there are a couple of articles uh, I've written which may be useful. One 
lists seven buttons you should be using in WordPress. Um, the same buttons are in uh, Medium, or I think most or all of them are. So um, this, these tips apply for Medium as well. Have a read of that and make sure you're using those buttons to, to format your text, add scannability and interactivity. And a second article uh, details nine common mistakes. It's been updated. Nine common mistakes when writing for the web and what to do about them. So that provides a nice checklist as you go along, as well as the basic checklist. And on that note, uh, the task that I would like you to do now is write some sort of story or article. It can be behind the scenes of your particular production or it can be a feature. It doesn't really matter what the story is. The key thing is, is that once you've written it, edit it against those basic principles. Check it for brevity. So I'll split up paragraphs, for example. Edit for scannability. So you may well introduce subheadings, links, bullet points, and so on. Edit for interactivity. Consider uh, the A and the C as well, adaptability and conversation. And check it against some of the checklists that I've just introduced there.